I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and here today with me is Justin Hume, founder and publisher of Uranium Insider. Thank you so much for joining me online once again. Great to see you. Good to see you as well, Charlotte. Thanks for having me on again. Yes, of course. I'm really excited to talk to you today because there's been a lot going on in the uranium space since the last time we talked, I think back last fall. I'm hoping that, as usual, you can help us get a grasp on all the things that are going on, or at least some of them. I think right now what is still on people's minds is the war between Russia and Ukraine. I know that when this conflict first started happening, there are a lot of concerns about how it could impact the supply chain, because Russia is not only a producer of uranium, but it's also involved in conversion and enrichment. So to begin with, I wanted to ask you, what should we know about Russia and uranium? Russia is a, a major player in the uranium products um, in the fuel cycle and a major provider of uranium products globally. Russia, they have um, a pretty small percentage of market share for mined U-308, uh, just the, you know, the first step in the fuel cycle. Most of that comes through uh, joint ventures with Kazatomprom in Kazakhstan uh, with Uranium-1. Um, however, they're, they are the largest provider of both conversion and enrichment. They control about 38% of the conversion market, about 43% of the global enrichment market. So it's absolutely huge. Um, those are the largest implications in terms of this particular conflict. Um, of course, there are some knock-on effects, some secondary sanctions um, that, are, that are potentially impacting the market as well. But the conversion and the enrichment markets are having the biggest impact and that has to do with Russia's market share of those two markets. Conversion was and is uh, the largest bottleneck in the fuel cycle in terms of uh, the elements of the fuel cycle flowing through the fuel cycle from mined uranium all the way to fabricated fuel conversions kind of right in the middle. And it's already been the bottleneck since Converdine shut down the Metropolis plant in the United States in 2018. Um, that plant is set to come back online next year. However, it's set to come back online, I believe, at a 50% capacity. And so it's just one of those things where it's very difficult for the West's conversion capacity to ramp up quickly to meet this renewed demand from Western utilities that are seeking conversion, uh, ex-Russia conversion. Um, the same thing with enrichment. And the demand, when you have, when you have um, supply constraints, for uranium, generally speaking, you'll almost always see demand at the end of the fuel cycle first. So a utility will seek out um, enriched uranium primarily uh, in order to get the material sooner. So if they were to go out and panic buy U-308, they still have to run that material all the way to the fuel cycle in order to get their fabricated fuel out the other end 18 months later. So if they can buy enriched uranium, then they've got only one more step and that's to fabricate the fuel and ship it to the plant. And that could take, you know, maybe six months. So um, you see demand for enrichment happen first. And that's exactly what we're seeing with big moves in the, in the cost of enrichment. We saw the SWU price, which is essentially the cost of enrichment uh, stands for separate of work unit. That price jumped up by about 50% in March alone. Um, we saw conversion jump by over 60% in March alone. So enrichment and conversion are seeing very large renewed demand from Western utilities, and it's looking unlikely that um, Russian conversion and, and enrichment is going to be sought after from Western utilities anytime soon. Yeah, and so there's there's been a huge impact really on those, at least those two aspects of the market. I think what, what COVID-19 did and now what the war between Russia and Ukraine has done has really cast light on supply chain issues. So when you look at uranium, do you see, and you started to talk about this a little bit, but do you see other countries starting to step up and trying to look within their borders to, to build up their supply chains? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in my opinion, that's definitely happening, especially for the countries that have um, a lot of nuclear energy as part of their grid. So that'd be the United States and France um, and a number of other countries, but those are the biggest ones. United States being the largest producer of nuclear energy, therefore the largest consumer of uranium products. Um, so there's, there's legislation that's being proposed in both the House of Representatives and the Senate, bipartisan in the United States, that is both supportive of nuclear energy 
going forward, supportive of life extensions for nuclear plants and supportive of the uranium fuel cycle, including expanded enrichment conversion and support for the miners. Um, so that's that's been a really big element of support for domestic nuclear energy production and all things uranium fuel cycle in the United States. Um, and to your point, you know, this this whole situation really, in my opinion, is bringing up kind of a an accelerated shift from globalism to nationalism. I think that we're going to see um, the global economy shift dramatically. We already are seeing that. And I think that it's exposed vulnerabilities, especially in energy um, for nations across the world. And some nations, of course, that are highly beholden to Russian oil and gas are having an extremely difficult time right now. One of those primarily is Germany, not only because they've been um, highly reliant on Russia's gas imports, but because they've made the decision to shut down all of their nuclear reactors. They still have three remaining online and they're set to shut down this year. And stubborn as they might be, they don't seem to be considering to um, keep those online, nor bring the three that they just shut down that have yet to be decommissioned back online. So against all logic, Germany is staying course. Now, the previous, um, was it the previous chancellor? Uh, it was either the previous chancellor, I think it was a previous chancellor from a couple of administrations ago, now sits on the board of directors for two prominent Russian um, gas and oil companies. Uh, I found that very, very interesting. So that might help to tell the story of the direction that Germany has taken. But long story short, uh, the situation in the Ukraine with Russia's invasion and the um, political and uh, the geopolitical and the commodity implications that have come from that invasion are massive and they're affecting multiple markets, including uranium. Right. And, you know, maybe kind of in contrast to Germany, I wondered if we did, could talk about the recent news that we're hearing, I think just this week, that the U.S. wants to spend something like six billion dollars to kind of save some nuclear plants in the country. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that that actually was part of uh, the infrastructure bill that was signed last year. That's 500, what was it, 550 billion, something like that. And there's six billion that was slated for support of nuclear uh, nuclear power plants in the U.S. Uh, the Department of Energy released a put out a release. Uh, just was that yesterday or a few days ago, actually, um, stating just re re recommitting to this, basically saying that yes, there is six billion dollars of funding that is set to support nuclear plants if a nuclear power plant is on the quote unquote chopping block due to economic reasons that utility can um, apply for credits from this program to get um, economic support to keep the plant online it's essentially the administration saying we value these nuclear power plants um, at which <laughs> is is obvious it's it's obvious that these are vitally important as 20 percent of the grid in the united states but of course for clean energy which they continue to hammer home as being you know, the topic of, of the day of the year of the decade, potentially. So um, yes, they they're recommitting to that. And they stated that they will put out more information later this week, um, giving specific details on how utilities can apply for these credits. So that's, that's very, very good to see. Right. And so, as you mentioned, we are in this clean energy transition. Everybody wants to move toward greener sources. And as we know, uranium is not always included in, in that category. Sometimes some nations are more willing to do that than others. Overall, would you, see, would you say that we're seeing uranium, I guess, gain more traction as, as a clean energy solution for the future? Oh, definitely. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Um, you know, there's there's stories coming out almost on a weekly basis of uh, yet another country embracing nuclear as as a potential solution for quote unquote climate change for a carbon free future. Um, Japan is recommitting to their restarts. They want nuclear to be 20 to 22 percent of their electricity mix by 2030. Um, and that would mean an additional dozen or so plants restarted. They've now restarted 11 plants. And for the first time since Fukushima, the public opinion uh, is in a majority support for nuclear in Japan. So that's huge. Um, South Korea, uh, the previous president that had um, began the phase out of nuclear plants and had committed to an ultimate entirely phasing out of nuclear plants has just been replaced by a president that is staunchly pro-nuclear. 
um, all of the all of the candidates. Uh, this is really telling, actually, all the candidates in South Korea that were running um, for president were all supportive of, of nuclear, all supportive of both ending the phase out and potentially building new plants. And the, the president that did win was the most um, the most uh, staunchly advocate for for nuclear. So that's a good sign. Uh, Boris Johnson in the UK um, has just stated they want to build seven new plants by 2035. France uh, last year, at the end of last year, stated that they want to build six more by 2035 with the potential of an additional eight. So potentially up to 14 new plants in France, which is already 70% nuclear. So um, I think that it's becoming more and more clear. Um, this is something that was obvious to anybody who spent five minutes looking, looking into it over the past five years. But um, finally, we're seeing very stubborn um, politics, let's say, come around to nuclear in multiple countries around the world, including, you know, the EU taxonomy included um, nuclear as part of the green green taxonomy with uh, a potential for opening up to, to low cost green funding going forward. So very, very positive for nuclear. Right. These are some of the examples I was kind of hoping you would talk about. This is all on the demand side. And, you know, another important part of demand is we saw last year the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust kind of burst onto the scene and start start buying up pounds on the market. My sense is that, you know, excitement about that has cooled off a little, but of course, it's still a really important player in the market. So what would you highlight for investors there on the Sprott Trust side? Um, I would highlight a couple of things. One, this year so far, Sprott has made up 50% of the, of the purchasing of Sprott material in the Sprott market. Um, that's huge. Okay, so in a typical year, 80% of the, of the volume in the Sprott market is traders, trader churn. So pounds being traded back and forth. Now we're seeing literally 50% of the action in the Sprott market, the purchasing in the Sprott market coming from Sprott. So Sprott has become the Sprott market essentially. Um, uh, and of course, there's other players in there, but for the most part, the purchasing demand has come from the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. Um, there's a couple of points that I think are very important. One is that um, we're always going to see it ebb and flow. It's not going to be a constant premium to nav with a constant amount of, of, of funds flowing into it. That is going to go in cycles. Right now, we're at about 10 days in a row where they've traded close to NAV or at a slight discount. I think they're close to a 5% discount to net asset value. They've been up to a 10% discount to NAV. Typically that is bought up by investors who want to arbitrage that discount opportunity. Um, interestingly enough with Sprott um, reducing the purchasing because they haven't been issuing shares into the market at a discount to NAV and raising more cash to buy physical. Um, they've only purchased, I think two or 300,000 pounds in the last two weeks. And the spot market is remaining just just stuck at 63 75 a pound so we're not seeing in the past um when when sprot slowed down for a couple of weeks we'd actually see the spot market trade down we'd see traders take advantage of them being out of the spot market to manipulate that price back down that's not happening right now so that's that's a significant change another thing is just to kind of echo sprot ceo john champaglia that um there's a, a number of large funds that he's speaking to frequently that are literally waiting on the sidelines for sufficient liquidity to position. So from a retail investor perspective, it's easy to look at you know, weekly charts of some of the uranium stocks and be like, oh my gosh, we're up so much in the past three years. This rally has got to be close to over. And then you talk to somebody like, like, uh, like John at Sprott and he's telling you, yeah, the big money hasn't even, they, they can't even position yet because the market's not large enough and they will when it does. And so they're in process with the New York Stock Exchange listing currently. Um, we think they get it. Um, it's not a guarantee. It's a new vehicle for, for the NYSE in terms of a uh, physical uranium trust that will not have a redemption in it. There are other physical trusts, silver and gold, have redemption clauses where if you own shares of the trust, you can literally exchange those for physical metal and own that physical metal. For obvious reasons, that's not going to happen for the uranium trust. So there's an amendment that the NYSE has approved, and they have submitted that uh, proposed amendment to the SEC. It's under review currently. Um, we could know within uh, about 40 days. Of course, the SEC can extend that for an additional 45 days. So at the very latest, we should know about mid, about the second or third week of July of this year, whether or not the NYSE listing is happening. 
Um, large funds are not having a problem finding it on the TSX. We've seen huge block trades. Goldman Sachs is positioning in physical uranium. That was a big story a few weeks ago. So they're a huge player. And um, even that's one of the things that I look at is two things. One is the uranium rally over at $63 spot. Uh, clearly the answer is no. B, um, what, is, what are the primary vehicles in the space looking at in terms of potential investment flow? And we're hearing that directly from Sprott saying they're talking to hundred uh, funds with hundreds of billions, if not trillions in assets under management interested in positioning. They can't do it until we see 50, 60 million or more traded on a daily basis in volume on Sput. Of course, the NYSE li listing would clearly help that in terms of volume, um, but uh, it's, it's gonna happen either way. So um, a lot to look forward to with that vehicle and uranium in general. Okay, yeah, those are all really important points. So thank you for going through those with us. On the demand side, I also wanna make sure that we touch on what's going on with utilities. We, we talk about these every time that we speak, I think, and it's an important part of the market, but also very opaque. So one of the things that it seems like we've been waiting for is when will they start contracting again? My understanding is we are starting to see that, but I wondered if you could give an overview of what's going on, what we've seen so far, and what we can know about what may be coming next. Sure, well, we saw um, Cameco state that they had uh, contracted 40 million pounds in the first five weeks of the year. And they stated that in their fourth quarter conference call, um, that was more uranium contracted for that company than they did in the entire previous year, in the first five weeks of the year. Obviously, a lot of that had to do with um, that the Kazakhstan unrest that we saw in the second week of the year. And then, um, you know, towards the end of that was kind of the initial skirmishes between Russia and Ukraine. And that's only intensified. So um, UXC, which is one of the primary uh, nuclear fuel consultants, is, is reporting that uh, just under 60 million pounds have been contracted in term contracting this year, officially. Um, unofficially, there's a lot of action and discussions happening, um, you know, what, are, what do they say, off market. So um, there definitely is more interest in term contracting ticking up. This is nowhere near the levels of buying that we saw in the heights of the previous bull market. And will that still happen? We believe that it will. Um, we could see hundreds of millions of pounds contracted within uh, even a course of a few months. So, But the fact that we're seeing 60 million pounds contracted in the first three months of the year is a good sign. That will be the, if that pace continues, that'll be the largest year of term contracts in the past um, at least five years. So um, it is ticking up. It is improving. I think that a lot of players are still on the sidelines right now, literally trying to reassess how they're going to go forward with the current geopolitical situation, trying to understand um, how soon will this end and will this go back to us being able to purchase uranium from Russia. A lot of, um, you know, I, I've spoken with fuel buyers in the past and Prior to all this happening, you know, they would say that they love buying from Russia. They love buying from Russia, not only because it's sometimes less expensive, but it's a one-stop shop. You can go, you can go and contact um, uh, a Russian seller of uranium. You can buy the U-308. You can buy your conversion. You can buy your enrichment. They'll fabricate the fuel, and you'll get it all delivered to you right on time. And that's been the case for a very, very long time. And so this is a huge shakeup. And there's a lot of players on the sidelines just wondering what is going to happen. And there's already a lot of self-sanctioning happening, which is there, there hasn't yet been official sanctions from the US, from the EU, or from Russia saying that they are not going to deliver the material. None of that has actually happened yet. But we are seeing a lot of utilities for a number of reasons um, seek pounds elsewhere, seek conversion elsewhere, seek enrichment elsewhere. And the reasoning for that twofold. A, um, from, a, from an ESG perspective, it doesn't look good to be buying from Russia right now for obvious reasons. And B, um, there could be a concern that even though the sanctions don't exist currently, that they could between the time of signing that contract and the delivery of the material. And if they sign that contract with Russia now to have material deli delivered in two years and, or let's say, you know, two years and beyond and 12, 18 months from now, there are sanctions then they get that material cut off and they have to source it elsewhere on a very short time frame. And utilities do not want to do that. Security supply is paramount. And this situation has highlighted that more than anything that we've seen in a number of years. 
Okay, and now I think moving over to prices, when we spoke last, it was in September of last year, you told us, you know, all bets were kind of off, prices probably weren't going to necessarily be moved by fundamentals. How are you feeling right now with, with everything that's going on? What's your thoughts on, on prices in 2022? Well, so much has happened since then, huh? Um, well, I think the fundamentals clearly are playing a part here. Um, and the in September, that was that move was entirely driven by the financial players, by Sprott, essentially. And Sprott, um, you know, when we last spoke, they had just in, um, turned on their ATM the previous month. So that was probably four or five weeks into their ATM going live. And I think they raised about 200 million in that first month. So that was that was a new a new stage that was being set, and clearly they are still um, massive players in the space. They purchased 14 million pounds this year already. Um, they they're sitting on 55 million pounds of uranium, where they came into it with 18 million pounds from UPC. So the financialization of the sector is still very very prominent, especially when it comes to the spot market, which is the element of the market that uranium investors watch and they track and they because you know, it's reported intraday almost in real time it's visible it's free and the other the other elements of the fuel cycle if you want more frequently than monthly updates on them you have to pay you know for very pricey subscriptions to the um to the nuclear fuel consultants so with all of that said um the fundamentals are now in play more than ever um, you not only do you have this huge disruption to the fuel cycle with uh, with Russia, but you also have, like I've already mentioned, um, all of the positive uh, happenings in terms of nuclear being embraced. Um, and so the sector continues to grow. The growth that projections for the sector are not slowing down. In fact, they're increasing. Um, so it's creating a situation for utilities. You know, the, the unique thing about uranium Gosh, there's so many unique things. Two really important things that are unique. One, the fuel cycle and all elements of the fuel cycle are very slow to respond to price. So what you see, the initial response to price that you see is above ground inventories being moved around, being sold, or in some cases, like now being held more tightly. You might expect, okay, we were at $30 uranium a year ago. Now we're at 64. Why aren't we seeing more material come into the market? Well, a lot of times with uncertainty of the market, that material is more tightly held rather than being more frequently and freely sold into the market. And that's actually what we're seeing right now. So, um, but, you know, mining obviously can't respond quickly, especially uranium mining for obvious reasons. Even the mines that are already built and on care and maintenance, like MacArthur River, um, very complex mine to come back online. And they're talking about reduced capacity of 15 million pounds in 2020, uh, 2023. Um, Langer Heinrich Paladin's mine in Namibia, they're not going to be up into, into production until 2024. They just raised the money to bring it back online. That's a mine that was previously producing not that long ago. So new mines are going to take even longer. And that's just the U308. Conversion capacity is going to take time to expand. Enrichment capacity in the West is going to take time to expand, assuming that Russia will continue to be cut off from the Western utilities, at least um, voluntarily so. So that's one important point. Um, the other important point is that um, uranium is essential. It's absolutely essential. And these plants are, uh, are not going to uh, risk being shut offline uh, and being taken down because of price. Um, the cost of uranium is a small percentage of the overall cost of running a plant. And now we're seeing countries actually support the plants economically. And the utilities have a little bit of inventory. So the U.S. has around two years. The EU has, uh, you know, three, maybe three to four years of inventory. So these shocks only really severely affecting utilities that are uncovered in the short term. And that's those are the utilities that you'll see uh, make purchases along the fuel cycle that start to push these moves that we're seeing in conversion enrichment and in U308. But um, that buffer of inventory um, sort of it buffers the prices in the short term and it can and it even with that buffer we're seeing these huge moves in the fuel cycle but there's so many spinning spinning elements to this this investing thesis it's important to understand all of that um and distill it down to what that means for you as an investor so for us the understanding of uh not only this this buffer that most utilities have but also the slow the slow response to the price leads to an inevitable price spike. And I, I think that it's more likely to happen now than, than I would have said even a year ago, um, that I would have said it would be a longer and slower bull market. And I think that 
um, the, the things that have happened over the past year have changed that. And we're likely to see some extremely strong moves in the, in the U308 because we're already seeing those in the rest of the fuel cycle. And there's always a trickle down from enrichment to conversion down to U308. So that is yet to happen. The moves we've seen in U308 have been almost entirely driven by Sprott. Um, I hate to say it, but it's true. And so um, now we're going to see the fundamentals come into play for U308. We're going to see utility demand compete with Sprott and where the price goes is anyone's guess. Okay, very interesting. And let's talk a little bit about the uranium equities against this backdrop, very interesting backdrop that we have right now. Where are we seeing movement and where are we perhaps not seeing as much movement among the stocks? The largest movement we've seen um, since, let's say since the Russian invasion. So in the past three to four months, the largest movement we've seen has been in the physical metal and in the large caps. We've seen really strong moves in Cameco. Cameco obviously has become a sector leader due to their messaging to the market of um, the increase in their contracting. They also have a conversion facility at Port Hope. Uh, and with the price of conversion skyrocketing, they're doing well up there. Um, so Cameco has had really strong moves. The physical metal has moved really strongly. Um, two weeks ago, we sent out a bulletin to our members highlighting that we believed that the performance of the equities relative to the metal had bottomed and that the equities were going to play catch up. Now that started to happen. We're seeing a bit of a pullback this week so far, but um, we think that the equities have some catching up to do in terms of the spot price of the metal. And so, um, you know, nothing goes up in a straight line, but um, most of the equities charts look very, very bullish here, very supportive. A lot of them are in this really unique pattern called a Livermore, Livermore accumulation cylinder. And it's essentially this megaphone shaped pattern where we see a series of higher highs, higher lows, and the higher highs tend to get steeper and steeper when new amounts of volume come in. We've really yet to see the sector light up in the way that we know that it can. And so we continue to position. I mean, we've been in this trade for uh, over three years. We continue to position here because the fundamentals dictate that, um, that strong moves are still ahead of us. So, yeah. Right. And we've talked about before your positioning in the sector. I know you have a focus on the developers. So you've done a lot to build up that position. Are there, are there many changes that you're making right now? And how do you determine when you might want to, to make a different move? Sure. We've done a bit of rebalancing this year. Um, we actually rebalanced the entire portfolio to make room for a new position um, in a company that we're really excited about. Um, we, we trade in and out of being, um, long physical and long equities, not, um, there, I mean, we, our core holdings, we remain long essentially for the most part, we are buy and hold and add on weakness. Now, of course, if you want to keep adding with a model portfolio that we have, that we're hundred percent accountable, um, you know, you have to create that cash in order to add new positions. So we like to trim, uh, certain holdings on uptrends and create a bit of cash and then uh, buy on weakness. Now, what we really like to do is we like to add a little bit of options plays into the mix. So uh, we really love um, vertical call spreads. We have one on right now where we're up over 50% with the underlying holding up about 20%. Those are the that's the type of leverage we like to we like to do where it protects your downside as well with the spread by being short the out of the money call. Um, and that um, so those spreads, obviously they roll off and they dump cash into your account. And then we hold that cash and we, we rinse and repeat. We wait for a, a interest cycle low to re-enter these spreads. And so in addition to some of our core holdings that we are likely to hold um, full positions or mostly full positions through uh, the bull market, uh, we like to trade in and out of these options plays. And of course, you know, if, if the story changes or we feel like a story has run its course, or something fundamentally changes about a company um, that we do own, we can be quite um, cutthroat about cutting it and repositioning that cash or just holding that cash. So, um, you know, we don't get married to our investments. We communicate with the management frequently. We keep track of all of these companies uh, uh, very closely, and um, we try to we try to create as much leverage as we possibly can in a safe manner. We don't trade on margin ever. We never recommend that. But you know, last year we outperformed URNM by by about fifty percent. So we're pretty proud of that track record. And this year it's looking good as well. So yeah. Okay, very good. And listening to you speak today, it's it's occurred to me. So we know that we can invest in uranium exploration, develop my development and mining companies. What about if you wanted to get exposure to 
you know, conversion and, and enrichment, that kind of thing. Is that something that you can do? Because it sounds like that's the part of the market that's really seeing kind of a big squeeze right now. There's not a lot of options in that realm, to be honest. Um, Cameco, like I mentioned, is, I believe, the only publicly traded company that has exposure to conversion. Um, so, you know, the French have conversions, but EDF is, um, is essentially a standout corporation. Um, so Cameco has conversion exposure. Whether or not the market is giving any value to that is hard to say. I mean, the stock is outperforming the sector substantially. So um, that's entirely possible that investors are aware of that at least somewhat. Um, as far as enrichment goes, there's a company in the States called Centris Energy. They're an enricher. Um, they're, they are a maker of HALU, a high assay, low, ener uh, low enriched uranium. But a lot of their supply comes from Russia. So that's probably why you've seen that stock underperform. But in terms of enrichment and conversion, there's not a lot of options for, for publicly traded investments. Okay, interesting. Just curious. That is all from me today, unless you have any final thoughts that you would leave us with for uranium in 2022. I mean, just final thoughts is I would say that um, I don't think most investors are uh, considering the types of moves that are still uh, potential to come in this market. Um, like I said, we're up a long ways since the March 2020 lows. But, um, you know, when, when, when funds... When funds get a hold of an opportunity and they recognize it and the liquidity is sufficient to enter that opportunity, they can be extremely cutthroat about it. They can really go for the jugular. And we have not seen that happen. While we're seeing flows that are that are substantial, you know, we've seen, I mean, Sprott has raised 750 million this year alone through the Sput vehicle. And that's with barely any issuance in the last two weeks. Um, the, the amount of money that could come into the sector is phenomenal. And we're still, I think we're less than 45 billion total market cap. We're probably at about 42 billion total market cap for the sector. It's very, very small. Um, and so we're, we're very hopeful about, about the funds that could flow into the sector that we expect to. So we continue to, uh, to add on dips. And so far, I mean, it works until it doesn't. And it's continued to work over the past, past three years uh, when we see weakness in the sector. Buying that weakness has... Um, every single time resulted in very strong performance. So until we see fundamental reasons to justify otherwise, that continues to be our strategy going forward. So, yeah. It makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you so much for coming on to talk today. Always great to have you. My pleasure, Charlotte. Thanks again for having me. Great. And once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and this is Justin Hume with Uranium Insider.